also been given an additional course. So you, if you already know this information, that's all right. But let me uh, start with amputations. What is an amputation? An amputation is a removal of a part or pole of a limb or appendage. It need not necessarily be limb. But for the purposes of our uh, rehabilitation and so on, we are considering only amputation of upper limb and lower limb. But if the, if the part of an ear is uh, cut off or a tongue is cut off or a nose is cut off, whatever is cut off, it is still called amputation. Okay, but these are cosmetic and not within uh, our uh, field. So when we talk about amputation, we are talking about upper limb and lower limb. So now what are the indications for uh, amputation? An amputation is a very uh, significant procedure. It is a life-changing procedure. Before you can think of cutting off a part of a limb, there has to be strong indications for the same. So with the advances in surgical procedures, many of the conditions for which amputations used to be done earlier are no longer uh, uh, done, whereas they are, uh, amputations are no longer done, but instead they do salvage surgery. So right now, there are some uh, only very uh, clear indications for an amputation. These, um, uh, these indications include non-salvageable trauma. So if you have a part of the limb that has been uh, uh, crushed beyond repair, or where the um, part has been lost, you know, if, uh, if there is a traumatic amputation during an RTA or uh, uh, an industrial accident, and the part that has been amputated could not be saved or could not be brought back in a reattachable state to the hospital, that, can, that this is what is meant by non-salvageable trauma. Because if the part is brought back, and in uh, adequate time, very often now, it can be reattached using microsurgical procedures. So if this is not possible, so that is non-salvageable trauma. Or sometimes if it is crushed beyond repair, then it would become, that is what is one indication for an amputation. Other amputation, other indications, these are not really true anymore because we have high level antibiotics, which can pretty much manage all infections. But if the infection has been going on for too long or if there are fungal or virus infections, which do not have a medication, bacterial infections can pretty much be managed with antibiotics. But some fungal infections and some viral infections cannot yet be managed. And if you have osteomyelitis or significant facial damage because of infections that are spreading and not responding to uh, medical management, then an amputation may be necessary. This is a very rare case nowadays, but it is sometimes still necessary. Then malignancy, malignancy that is, uh, you know, significant malignancy, widespread malignancy. Because if there is a malignancy, osteosarcoma, most, uh, most common, if there is uh, osteosarcoma of the knee, for example, uh, upper end of tibia, most common site, then earlier, like uh, even uh, 20 years ago, the only option was to amputate. But now that is uh, no longer, uh, more than 20 years ago. But from about the last 20 years, it, it is no longer necessary. So because they will uh, remove only the part of the bone which has been, which has the malignancy, remove it and then reattach it with, uh, re, uh, salvage it with bone cement. So um, widespread malignancy, when the malignancy is so severe or uh, so widespread that uh, it is not possible to salvage, only then would it be an indication for, malign uh, for uh, amputation. Another uh, indication also becoming rare nowadays with early identification in, uh, in uh, uh, prenatal scanning is congenital deformities. Congenital deformities that may result in a non-functional limb. Now, this used to be pretty common until um, prenatal scanning became uh, mandatory. Now, in prenatal scanning, they can pretty much find out if a limb bud is not um, developing properly. And... Uh, you know, more often than not, the parents decide to uh, ab abort the child, terminate the pregnancy. But in cases where they choose not to terminate the pregnancy or in cases where uh, it may have been missed 
because of uh, inadequate um, prenatal scanning and it has and the pregnancy has reached a level where they can no longer terminate it then there might be congenital deformities mainly congenital deformities would be absence of a limb a partial or complete absence of a limb this is going to be a further class so uh, i will be talking about it later on so uh, if you have uh, focomelia uh, amelia and uh, uh, dysmelia, these are some of the conditions that can happen. There might be congenital absence of radius, along with that, uh, some of the fingers. There might be congenital absence of the whole limb, and there's only a uh, only a, a residual uh, muscular attachment, I mean, soft tissue attachment to the shoulder with no bone. So these are all called, uh, these are all called um, limb bud deficiencies or um, absence of limbs. So in such cases, it may be required to amputate the uh, part that is there, which may not have skeletal support, so that the function, I mean, the uh, processes that is given gives better function than the uh, limb bud that is remaining. Then the most common indication for amputation is vascular insufficiency in the adult where because of atherosclerosis, chronic smoking, uh, diabetes, uh, etc., you may have vascular insufficiency or gangrene. Is that clear? Indications is clear? Respond. Respond on the chat. All right. T. T is not a response. Yes would be a response. Anyway. Uh, now, some of the important points for an amputation, uh, this is obviously not for us, it is for the surgeon, but why we need to know this is based on these guidelines is how we know what we can rehabilitate. So some of the important points for the surgeon are they must preserve as many joints as is possible because each joint that is removed will increase the energy cons uh, consumption by 17 to 28%. So if they remove an ankle and they still have to walk, then the energy consumption of ambulation increases by 17%. And like that, it keeps on increasing. So the more joints that are gone, the greater the um, energy consumption required of functional activities. This is especially true of lower limb amputation, but it is also true of upper limb amputation. So one of the important points is to preserve as many joints as is possible. Now, another point is to the longer the stump or the residual limb, as we call it now, the better. Except in one case, if, it, if the residual limb is too long and cannot uh, accommodate a prosthesis appropriately. So one of the reasons, one of the um, situations here, especially, is a uh, transtibial or BK uh, amputation and a Symes amputation, where because of the length of the limb, the prosthesis fitting becomes uh, difficult, or it uh, or the processes may not it may not be appropriate uh, for uh, fitting because of which the limb with the prosthesis may end up being longer than the normal limb or the intact limb. In which case, the intact limb will have to have a shoe raise. So these are things that we also need to be able to understand when we do a pre-prosthetic assessment. Then ideal shape. Ideal shape, depending on the type of amputation we are talking about, requires uh, different types of shape. Now, this is not very, very important when you have new generation prosthesis. New generation prosthesis can accommodate any type of uh, 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 residual limb shape, but this is true when we are using traditional sockets, and um, uh, therefore there there are certain uh, uh, certain um, required or ideal stump requirements for the transtibial amputation and for the AK amputation, AK or transfemoral amputation. Another point is the sooner the process is fitted, the better the outcomes. It is like everything else; early intervention is all it gives better results. Early prosthetic fitting can be as early as in the OR itself, in the, in the uh, operation theater. After they amputate, they can put a, um, a temporary limb attached with, with the foot piece and the person can start ambulating on the 
third post-op-date. But of course, the uh, requirement is that the vascularity is intact and that there is no significant infection which needs to be dressed. So early prosthetic fitting is another important point. The earlier, the better. The later, it be the uh, more prolonged the prosthetic fitting, the more delayed the prosthetic fitting, the more likely for uh, deformities to occur, for the stump to become weak, and uh, prosthetic fitting may become not so, uh, not so efficient. Early mobilization, this is necessary for us. Early mobilization, as soon as the person is out of anesthesia and pain is more or less controlled and the drain has been, uh, and, the, and that is not significant drainage, then we need to start early mobilization, most often on the second or third post of day. Good vascularity, so good vascularity and as many joints as possible and longer the stump goes together. The surgeon must identify the uh, point to which there is adequate vascularity, at which is the point where they will do the amputation. Now, there are uh, salvage procedures for this also. So let us say the gangrene or the uh, uh, actual indication for vascularity uh, for amputation is only at the transtibial level, but even higher than that, vascularity is not great. They can do revascularization procedures along with the amputation. In such cases, of course, early prosthetic fitting would not be possible. So these are some of the points that you must understand from the chart when you uh, look at the chart review so that you can plan your, uh, your uh, rehabilitation better. Sensation, wherever, uh, if, the, if there is loss of sensation, then it is better to amputate at that part, except again, if, they, if we are doing new generation prosthetics, in which case it is not a major concern. Clear? Any questions? Other important points that would be uh, necessary for us to know would be functional ROM, the remaining joints or the limb or the joints that are uh, preserved must have functional range of motion. Now, the functional range of motion depends naturally on the joint we are talking about. If we are talking about the knee, functional range of motion would be 100, 0 to 110 degrees of flexion because 110 degrees of flexion is what is required for stair climbing uh, carefully. No prosthetic knee is going to allow for squatting. So that is out of the question. So complete range of motion is, uh, is desirable, but it is not mandatory. Functional range of motion is what needs to be there. So one of our uh, primary or acute care or even pre-op uh, uh, management would be to ensure that the joints that are going to be or that are preserved have functional range of motion and maintain that so that prosthetic fitting and post-amputation post rehabilitation becomes easier and more effective. Functional muscle strength, functional muscle strength of the residual limb, of the opposite limb and of upper extremities. Uh, uh, following an amputation, naturally the patient is going to be walking with walking aids and um, uh, the opposite limb is going to have to bear twice the weight that it was normally used to because it now has to perform the functions of both limbs along with the uh, walking aids. The uh, residual limb, meanwhile, will have to be prepared to take on the weight of an inanimate object or the prosthesis. So the uh, residual limb, whichever uh, muscles have, will be used for gait and whichever muscles will be required for stability will have to be significantly stronger than the same muscles on the intact limb because now the residual limb will have to take the weight or, and function of an inanimate object which is going to be attached to it. So if the quadriceps on the uh, intact side is let us say 50 psi <clears throat> we would expect it to be at least 50 percent stronger on the residual limb so this becomes another immediate uh, pre also and immediate post-op goal for physiotherapy to increase the strength or range of motion already have finished the increase the strength of the residual limb 
especially the muscles that are going to be involved in gait and those that are going to be involved in stability to at least 50 to 75 percent stronger than that of the intact limb. Now, the uh, lower the amputation, the less the requirement for greater uh, strength. Now, the higher up you go, the greater the requirement for increased strength. Is that clear? Is the logic clear? Okay. Um, upper extremities, it's basic, basic uh, crutch muscle strengthening kind of thing. Nothing uh, significant about that that you do not know. Opposite limb, likewise, would have to be necessary. I mean, would have to be uh, strong enough in order to take the, uh, to walk. That's just like any other trauma. Then balance and coordination exercises. Balance and uh, uh, coordination. Now you have to remember that now this residual limb is going to be taking a metal and plastic limb forward. So that requires a lot of balance because uh, when we walk, we think about, we do not think about it. It happens automatically. It is, uh, it is an innate skill that we have learned. Now this skill will have to be relearned in case of uh, prosthetic fitting. So balance and coordination exercises we will start doing from the beginning and um, so that they, they, have the they have adequate balance to, I mean adequate ability to balance on the intact limb without uh, falling or losing the balance. Endurance, like already said, every joint that goes increases the energy requirement of ambulation by by multiples of 17 percent so uh, and this keeps on increasing as the patient uh, if the patient is obese if the patient is older or if the patient has comorbid conditions which almost always they will have because most of the time they're dealing with vascular uh, amputations so endurance will have to be built up even prior to prosthetic fitting so that would be your basic aerobic exercises, uh, cycling uh, or lifting weights, strength, strength training, etc. Motivation to work because working with the processes is extremely difficult and quite demotivating. So motivation is something that that is a factor in deciding whether the person should be fitted for a processes or not. So having said that, now most of the time, except in severe trauma, <clears throat> an amputation is an elective surgery. So if an amputation is an elective surgery, that we already we will all we will have at least two to three weeks of pre-op period if you have a good uh, amputation team. If you have a good amputation team, the physiotherapist and occupational therapist are already part of the team. Uh, when the surgeon decides that there is no option but to amputate. So in that case, preoperative rehabilitation strategies can be employed. So in the preoperative period, what you're doing is what I already said in the last couple of slides. We are going to try and increase the range of motion, strength, endurance, and balance. And we're going to do training regarding uh, what they can expect after the amputation. So when you do this, it is necessary to understand and uh, speak with the surgeon and understand exactly where they plan to amputate and what is the uh, size of the uh, stump that is likely to be remaining. So based on that is how you will work on your strength training, range of motion and endurance, endurance and balance activities. Because if they are going to do a very short um, BK amputation, then the knee will be, may have to be encased, even though the knee is intact, it may have to be encased in the processes if the, uh, if the BK stump is very short, in which case most of the muscle activity will come from the, th from the hip muscles. And so these are things that you have to understand in the pre-op period so that you can start appropriate and adequate rehabilitative training. In the immediate post-op period, you require, I mean, it, it is like any other trauma, you're doing uh, chest care, continue with preoperative exercises, early mobilization of residual limb, as well as functional mobility. If the residual limb is encased in plaster of Paris, there is no way that you can do early mobilization. So you will work with whichever joints are free 
and uh, start out of bed as soon as possible. The sooner they start uh, walking out of bed, uh, the sooner they, they're mobilized out of bed, the lesser the post-operative complications. IPPF is immediate post-op prosthetic fitting. If they have done immediate post-op prosthetic fitting, which is done in the operation theater at the time of the surgery. So that would be the residual limb would be encased in plaster, plaster of Paris, at the end of which there will be a shank and a foot piece that are attached. So the purpose of an IPPF is that immediately they can start ambulating and they will be able to ambulate weight bearing is tolerated uh, with or without crutch depending and uh, for minor ADL. When if you are doing that, you must be very careful to make sure that the uh, that there is no increased bleeding uh, if in the uh, drainage. Drainage too will be attached. Uh, so you have to make sure that the, that the drainage is not significant. If there is too much drainage, you must inform the surgeon and stop ambulation and mobilization immediately. Clear? Is that clear? It appears that only four or five people are attentive, only they will get attendance. If the rest of you do not answer, you're not going to get any attendance. Because I will have a, a copy of the chat, so I know who has responded and who has not responded. Continuing on with immediate post-op management, strengthening of gait muscles, crutch muscles, maintain mobility, prevent tightness and deformity. That is maintaining uh, range of motion, ensuring that extreme, that the uh, ranges of motion that are functional are maintained. So these are, uh, these are your indication, I mean, these are your goals for immediate post-op management. Then balance training, weight bearing training, when the, uh, when the surgical site has healed. This is in case of no IPPF. When the surgical site has healed, you start with weight bearing activities, especially in an AK amputation. An AK or a transfemoral amputation is one that is going to be an end weight bearing, partially end weight bearing stump. So if it is a partially end weight bearing stump, what it means is that the weight of the body is going to go through the end of the stump onto, and will be transferred onto the socket of the uh, prosthesis. The thigh, the part of the thigh which has been amputated has not been used to weight bearing because normally only our foot, only the sole of our foot, a plantar aspect of our foot is uh, suitable for, has been used to weight bearing. So in the, uh, these cases, it will become very painful and difficult for the patient to deal with uh, weight bearing. So you have to start with weight bearing activities in nail standing or in uh, other uh, mat exercises in order to, uh, to prepare the stump for a prosthetic fitting that is desensitization activities of the end of the stump now this is not required if it is a bk amputation because the end of a bk and bk stump is not going to be weight bearing the process is fitted is uh, usually fitted in such a way that the weight bearing goes through the petal tendon and uh, the end of the stump is not uh, going to bear any weight and therefore what you would do in a bk amputation would be to do knee uh, weight bearing in kneeling because that is the part of the uh, body that is going to be don't unmute yourself you cause that that is a part of the body which is going to be bearing weight in the uh, prosthetic in, in the prosthesis and uh, functional mobility and training is uh, teaching them how to do bed mobility, transfers, and ambulation. Late post-op or pre-prosthetic fitting. This is the uh, sutures have healed. A drain is obviously off. Everything is uh, okay. The patient has been discharged. And the uh, patient, uh, I mean, pre-prosthetic training is... Um, pre-prosthetic, uh, this, this is called the late post-op or pre-prosthetic fitting uh, stage. So now the, or the prosthetist has already, the prosthetic team has already decided 
which kind of processes to give. And so you know what kind of socket the patient is going to have. And you have, uh, so you have a clear goal on what you're supposed to do. So at this point, you continue with your range of motion and uh, muscle strengthening regimen. Please excuse the spelling mistake. It is not regimen, this is not the army. It is regimen. And uh, desensitization uh, will continue on all the parts of the, uh, of the uh, residual limb that is going to come in contact with the socket. And you know, if the patient complains of phantom sensation or phantom pain, this has to be addressed addressed with physiotherapeutic, pharma, pharmacological, and psychological measures. What we will do is we will do uh, desensitization techniques that is like rubbing the place, uh, graded motor imagery. These are the things that we do for uh, uh, phantom pain and phantom sensation. Uh, graded motor imagery, you must have been taught in uh, uh, chronic pain. Have you been taught about graded motor imagery? Have you been taught about graded motor imagery in pain management? No. Okay. Uh, we'll deal with that later. But at the moment, um, I think there is a course that I have identified for you all to do on graded motor imagery so that you can do that. So the, if not, it will be hopefully taught in CRPS, whoever is teaching CRPS. It is the same technique that we will use for uh, phantom sensation and phantom pain. Um, prosthetic, the last phase is the prosthetic phase when the process is fitted and we are doing prosthetic rehabilitation. Okay, so now if we can recap the stages of post-op, uh, the stages of amputee rehabilitation start from the pre-operative phase to immediate post-op phase to late post-op or pre-prosthetic fittings phase, and then finally the prosthetic phase. And after that, there will be follow-up. Clear? So what are the stages of rehab? Pre-amputation counseling and training, surgery, acute post-op, pre-prosthetic training, initial fitting, training, reintegration to community, long-term care. So the phases of the prosthetic. These are the phases of the prosthetic phase. The prosthetic phase itself has four uh, separate phases uh, consisting of initial fitting. Initial, initial fitting will happen with, uh, with the temporary processes. The temporary socket will be fitted then we will do the man we will do the initial uh, uh, training and then identify what are the problems get those problems sorted and then we uh, do the training and then uh, the final process the process is fitted final socket will be fashioned and the final process is fitted then the training is done person is reintegrated back into society and then the processes will have to be like any other machinery it will have to be serviced and uh, and uh, changed every so frequently. So that is the long-term care. Long-term care is at least twice a year, they must come to the prosthetic clinic to make sure that the process is still appropriate for the person because the patient can lose weight, they can gain weight, and the socket may stop fitting. Uh, moreover, the parts of those uh, processes which are mechanical, especially the joints, may wear out. So if it wears out, it is going to cause biomechanical uh, changes. And therefore, long-term care consists of frequent follow-up uh, for uh, prosthetic change fitting and, uh, and uh, service as required. So that those are the stages of rehabilitation. Everybody understood stages of rehab and what would be our goals in each phase? Okay. Coming to complications of amputations. Obviously, the first complication is pain. The pain can be at the surgical site. Uh, have they taught you about uh, post-operative pain syndrome in uh, cardio? Post-operative pain syndrome in cardio, they have taught you? No? Okay. Please write these things down and send me feedback. So these have to be taught. 
So pro post-operative pain syndrome is pain that persists after the uh, after the vascular, I mean, after the tissue damage has healed. You, we all know that uh, that once you have a surgical uh, once you have a surgical incision, after three to six weeks, it should have been completely healed. Pain that persists beyond six weeks of any uh, surgical uh, any surgery is what is called post-operative pain syndrome. So post-operative pain syndromes have many uh, many theories behind it. Some of them are vascular. Some of them would be neurological, including central sensitization. And it may just be some surgical problem. If that might be continued infection. So this, this is one, uh, pro one problem in amputation as well. Pain that persists. Then phantom pain. Phantom pain and phantom limb are, two, are completely different from, uh, from pain. So this pain is what they feel on the part of the limb that is intact, what, wherever the residual limb is there. And uh, when you have pain there, that is what is, or uh, proximal to that, that is what is of vascular, neurological, or surgical origin. Phantom pain or phantom limb is, uh, is something to do with the brain. The brain is not able to understand that this part has no longer uh, attached to the body and they start and they feel um, sensations in the part of the limb that has already been amputated. So, for example, they may feel that their uh, foot is itching and um, this can be very disturbing because obviously you cannot scratch the itch. It is there and there's nothing you can do about it. So these, um, that would be a phantom limb, uh, phantom sensation. Phantom pain is they feel unremitting pain in the part that is no longer there. So for this, again, is uh, like I already said earlier, we, you would need a multimodal approach, including psychological. From our part, it would be graded motor imagery and uh, early weight bearing and pharmaceutical, uh, pharmacological uh, uh, methods. To, uh, to deal with phantom pain or phantom limb sensations. So um, one of the things that has been found to work very well is um, graded motor imagery and uh, early weight bearing. So the earlier the patient starts ambulating, it, it has, uh, studies have shown that there is, that there is less uh, chance of, uh, uh, of phantom limb sensation. Yes, Nidhi? You have a question? Nidhi, you had a question. You raised your hand. Okay, I guess it was by mistake. Um, the other complications would be contractures. So what is your question then? Ask. Linda, uh, what's your question? Ask your question. If patient is feeling his hand is twisted behind <laughs> and he's feeling pain of that, so it will be a phantom limb a pain or sensation? If they feel pain, then it is pain. If they're just feeling itching or you know, the stimulus that is less than what we consider as pain, if they say that my hand is uh, cramping, then it could become, if it is painful cramp, it would become pain. If they're saying that I can't open my hands, it is closed and I cannot open it, that would become sensation. If he's telling the hand is twisted behind. If it, it is create, if it is causing pain, then it becomes pain. If it, if it is not causing pain, it is just a discomfort, then it becomes sensation. It is the intensity. See, the difference between phantom sensation and phantom pain is the intensity of the, of the discomfort. If the discomfort is so intense that it has become pain, then, it, then we call it phantom pain. Because if it becomes pain, then they're not able to uh, function like, like us. See, if you have a pain somewhere, then you're not able to function, right? Because your focus is completely on the pain. So it's the same thing here. Whereas if it is just a sensation, then uh, it is nagging, but they can still function. Then that is uh, that that would become phantom pain. The two things are uh, the physiology is the same. I mean, the pathology is the same, 
and our management is pretty much the same except the intensity of our management would differ depending on whether it is a uh, it is a uh, debilitating or a disabling condition phantom pain is disabling phantom sensation is a discomfort that's the only difference between the two answer your question Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma okay, fine. So, uh, coming to so the, where were we? Uh, so, the phantom pain and phantom limb, and then uh, complications would be contractures and deformities. There are so typical contractures and deformities that we can expect, uh, depending on the level of um, level of amputation. If it is a lower limb, I mean, if it is a BK amputation or a Trans femoral, trans tibial amputation, the most likely uh, deformity, as you all know, would be flexion of the knee because the hamstrings are uh, uh, likely to go into contraction because the uh, position of comfort is always knee flexion. Therefore, in your early post op period, you must be very, very careful not to give, an, uh, not to give a pillow under the knee. You have to keep the limb straight. No pillow under the knee, no pillow under the leg, except, of course, if there is significant bleeding and they need for nursing procedures, they need to keep it elevated. If that needs to be kept elevated, even then, the entire limb from the hip onwards or even better would be to lift the, uh, lift the uh, foot end of the bed. That is the best position. Lift the foot end of the, of the bed so that the the hip and knee are still in neutral, but the nursing requirement of, uh, uh, of the part above the heart is already, uh, is, is also achieved. So raising the foot end of the bed would be the best method in order to prevent excessive drainage or to prevent uh, uh, edema from happening. If you raise it on a pillow, then there is likelihood of, uh, uh, foot, I mean, the knee going into hamstrings, going into tightness and contracture, which would make it very difficult to uh, for do a prosthetic fitting. Now, if you give a pillow under the entire limb, then it can go into hip flexion contracture, which can also make it very difficult, not only for prosthetic fitting, but also for functional, uh, uh, for, uh, you know, for function and gait in the later years. Because if you have a, a hip that is flexed, then there is the compensation would have to happen from the, um, the compensation, into, compensation into extension would have to happen from the lumbar spine. And this can lead to severe uh, uh, lower back dysfunction in the future years. This is an, a very, very important aspect. Did you all understand? Because I know that in our hospital, y'all are putting pillow under the knee. I know that you're doing that despite my repeated instructions and an SOP and everything. Do you understand how you must, why you must not keep a pillow under the knee? Yes, okay. Third years, at least you don't do this when you start going to clinics, if you go to clinics this year, okay? Okay, then uh, dealing with um, strength deficits. Strength deficits uh, would be a complication because uh, if they have not, uh, if you have not adequately done pre-op management, which is the case in India, we, there are very few amputee uh, rehabilitation teams where we get adequate time for pre-op management and adequate time for uh, preparation because our patients come in when the leg is uh, practically falling off. And even though it is an elective surgery, the elective surgery becomes a very emergent procedure. And so there might not be time for pre-operative a management and when this happens the leg is already wasted or the or whatever is remaining is already uh, has gone into atrophy the muscles have gone into atrophy because the patients have neglected it for so long so strength deficits is a complication that we see practically every day in uh, india in amputated patients so these can lead to whenever one part is weak the uh, deficit has to be taken up by proximal parts. So that would lead to kinetic chain abnormalities, low back pain, etc. So, uh, so that this is a uh, complication. So they may just simply not be 
capable of using a processes. So therefore, they may just not use it. So these are problems of a strength deficit. These all, um, most of the time, BK amputees can manage. It is AK and above that, uh, that have these uh, complications or very old BK amputees. Balance deficits are, uh, if there is a, if there is, if there is a pre-existing condition like um, diabetes and diabetic peripheral neuropathy in the opposite limb. So they may not be able to walk with one limb and the other in the processes. So these balance deficits we must deal with. So if the balance is not adequate for them to walk independently, then, then that would be an indication for giving walking aids. Psychological concerns, it is not uh, our role. Our role is to appropriately uh, refer to a clinical psychologist because losing a part of the limb is a very devastating um, problem and patients may be tearful they may be depressed, they may have uh, a suicidal ideation. So if you identify any of these things, then you must refer to the appropriate person. Energy concerns, I've already repeated this twice. Uh, when you lose one joint, your energy requirements are much higher. So based on the requirement of energy and the patient's other comorbidities, we must consider giving the appropriate type of prosthesis and the appropriate walking aids. Now, what is the appropriate will naturally come later on. So right now, you just understand the theory. Do you all understand? Have you understood so far? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Now, after types of dressing, I'm going to stop this uh, class because there is a class scheduled for someone else at 10 o'clock and we need to uh, we need to free the um, Zoom platform. Types of dressing are immediate post-op rigid dressing. So immediate post-op rigid dressing means in the OR itself, in the occupation, in the uh, operation theater itself, after the surgery, they will put a plaster of Paris cast and they will leave only the area for the drainage and for dressing if required. So there will be a window cut into the, uh, cut into the plaster that allows the surgeon to do dressing and to inspect the wound to ensure that there is no infection. That is an immediate post-op rigid dressing. This is very often done in a BK amputation for obvious reasons. Some of you may know what the reasons are. One of the reasons being to keep the knee from going into flexion contracture. Others being uh, the difficulty in maintaining the knee in extension. And the, another being the requirement to uh, make sure that the BK, BK stump does not become edematous and bulky. So these are the reasons for a, uh, for a plaster of Paris dressing. It is a very good dressing, but sometimes it is not possible to do this dressing because of because there might be widespread infection or uh, they may not, the surgeon may not expect that the incision is going to heal adequately, in which case a rigid dressing may lead to later on complications because they may not be able to see the extent of the, uh, of the infection. So that, is, uh, so that is one type of dressing. The other type of dressing is immediate post-op process of sitting. This is usually done in clean stumps in healthy individuals where you're not expecting them. So this is usually in traumatic amputations or in uh, malignancies. Malignancies of the bone are uh, very common in the younger population. So in such cases, they may do immediate post-op dressing, um, immediate post-op prosthetic fitting. In vascular amputees and in the elderly amputees and in diabetic uh, uh, patients, this is not done because uh, early weight bearing on, a, on an already vascular compromised um, part of the limb may lead to greater level of vascular compromise and the amputation may have to be revised to a higher level. So that it is usually not done. It is usually done only in uh, younger individuals with uh, non-complicated amputations. If an immediate post-op rigid dressing is not possible, uh, an immediate post-op processes would be attached to a plaster of Paris. I already said this. And the third kind of uh, dressing would be if an immediate post-op plaster of Paris dressing is not possible, 
Then the next best is a compression bandage. Compression bandage is uh, many layers of, uh, uh, seven layers of uh, uh, cotton uh, that is, that is um, uh, encompassed with uh, uh, three layers of, uh, of uh, crepe bandage, of elastic, elastic crepe bandage. So that is a compression bandage. The compression bandage is done when a post-op rigid dressing is not possible for the exact same reasons in order to keep the knee uh, from uh, flexing or the hip from flexing and in order to prevent edema at the distal end of the stump. So the, uh, it, the reasons are the same, but a compression bandage is easier to manage because you can remove it. And, um, uh, and it is only done when a, a prosthetic, uh, when a, a plaster Paris dressing is not indicated for the reasons that I already stated. If this is also not possible, if a compression bandage is also likely to cause greater vascular compromise, if the, if the surgeon suspects that, then they will go with a basic uh, dressing, that is your soft dressing, which has many, many complications, which as you can imagine, would be uh, the uh, uh, deformity of the knee or deformity of the hip as the case may be, and um, uh, edema, because a soft dressing is just a dressing. It is not going to prevent any sort of, uh, it is not causing any compression and therefore it is not doing any a positioning or ni neither is it causing enough compression to prevent edema. I'm going to stop here. Do any of you have any questions? If you have any questions, raise your hand or ask on the group. Any questions so far? If no one has any questions, how do we prevent hip hiking abduction of operated limb? Uh, Etendra had a question. How do we prevent hip hiking? We do not want to prevent high hip hiking. Hip hiking is not a problem. Why would you think hip hiking is a problem, Etendra? Etendra? Why would you think hip hiking is a problem? <coughs> you are talking about ambulation. I am not reached ambulation yet. Hip hiking is a gait abnormality, which we will deal with uh, in future classes. What I am talking about now is during non weight bearing position or when the patient, where a person is walking without the prosthesis. Okay. All these things um, that I have spoken about now we have not reached the prosthetic phase yet. We are talking about early post-op and late post-op period. We are not talking about gait training. Gait training is an entire class and that will come in the future. Uh, hip hiking would be sometimes required because the abductors are not strong enough. Some, uh, but very often hip hiking is a gait abnormality due to long processes. We will deal with that later. That answer your question, Atendra? Any other questions? Hip abduction. Hip abduction was a very good question, Atendra. Hip abduction is a uh, is an abnormal is a deformity that we that we would expect in an uh, in an AK amputee because in an AK amputee uh, deformities. Do you know the pathophysiology of deformities? Deformities happen when a muscle is not opposed adequately by its antagonist. So in the case of the knee, uh, or uh, in the case of the knee, the hamstrings are unopposed by the, uh, by, the, uh, uh, by the quadriceps, even though the quadriceps are stronger because of the added effect of gravity uh, working on, the, uh, on, on our knee to make it uh, flex. So that is, that is one pathophysiology of knee uh, flexion. There are more reasons of comfort, etc. In the hip, you have abductors and adductors. Adductors, as you know, are longer than the abductors. So the adductors are attached closer to the knee. And when you have an, uh, when you have an AK amputation or a transfemoral amputation, the insertion of the adductors has been removed because this is happening at the 
uh, at the mid-thigh level. And so the abductors become unopposed and therefore a very common or the most common uh, deformity of, the, of an AK amputation would be an abduction contracture. An abduction contracture makes it very difficult to fit the processes. We will deal with more of this tomorrow as we are running out of time. Remind me tomorrow to deal with this when, I mean, uh, to discuss this when we are talking about AK amputation. If you have any more questions, save it for tomorrow because I really have to get off this so that the next class can happen. Thank you, everyone. Tomorrow, nine o'clock then. Bye-bye. Thank you.